Welcome everybody uh, to the Mobility What Works, What's Next session of the Global Cleveland Sister Cities 2020 Conference. My name is Matt Zellin and I serve as a council member for the City of Cleveland. Healthy and vibrant communities depend on a varied and flexible uh, modality systems. This panel will examine different applications of transit modals from urban centers across the globe to discuss best practices through a solution-based approach. <clears throat> I want to first begin off by thanking um, our sponsors for uh, today's session, Platform Brewery, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Slide Side Group, Almore Burn, the Rotary Club of Cleveland, Eaton, T Taiwan Sister Cities, CIP USA, Margaret Wong and Associates, Associates, T. Neo, the Peace Corps, and 12 Literary Arts. We have a, a fabulous panel of individuals who are going to speak to you today. I'm just going to read a brief letter to Dr. Sets about each one. Justin Bibb is Chief Strategy Officer of Ur Urbanova, a private public partnership for smarter and healthier cities. He leads the national expansion of an accelerator program with proven models and educators from Tulsa to Tampa on how we can tap uh, the data to solve urban challenges. Jacob Van Sickle uh, serves as the executive director of Bike Cleveland. Jacob works closely with volunteers and members to affect policy, legislation, and infrastructure that makes Cleveland's roadway safer and our neighborhoods more vibrant. Matisse Spudenek um, has been involved in policy planning, preparation of all strategies regarding sustainability, mobility in the city in the city of Lubanya, Slovenia. He leads projects of bike sharing and car sharing systems, the development of e-mobility, uh, e and more. And for the past five years, he's been charged for drawing the EU funds for building better mobility throughout his city. Ann Tilly is a research and policy analysis analyst with Cleveland City Council. Ann has been our leading voice on research and policy around micromobility, active transportation, and road safety. She also plays a critical role in expanding shared e-scooter and bike options throughout our city and currently serves as the co-chair of our data and evaluation committee for the Vision Zero Task Force. Carnage helped found the High Speed Rail Association in 1993. His passion for revitalizing the region he grew up in, lives in, and loves. The Alliance advocates for integrated rail and transit networks connected by 200 plus mile an hour high speed lines. By connecting cities, towns, and airports, the high speed trains will dramatically expand opportunities and slash the carbon emissions. And our last speaker is Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy serves as the Director of Port Control at the City of Cleveland's airport system since 2017. In his capacity, he provides leadership and oversight for two airport assets, Cleveland Hopkins International Airport, as well as Burke, Cleveland Burke Lakefront Airport, as well as the harbors. Uh, people often forget we are a harbor city. We sit right on the north coast, and our neighbor to the north is Canada. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this wonderful session with this wonderful group of speakers. What I will do as uh, an icebreaker uh, is I, I will throw out the first question to each of you to generate some dialogue and, uh, and then we'll begin our conversation. So first, although I know you don't have your camera on and we know you're with us, uh, my first question is for Ann Tilly. Um, and there are a number of mobility options out there. Why do we need all these new choices and all different types of uh, modalities? Thanks, Councilman Zone. Um, again, I want to apologize. I don't have my screen. I don't know what happened. I wish I could be uh, more visibly present. Um, but, you know, thinking about that question, I think there's a lot of ways you can answer it. And I'll try and stick to um, one slice here. But when we think about transportation, you know, I think it's inappropriate and quite frankly unfair to have a one size fits all approach. The way people move is uh, pretty dynamic and the right of way is constantly changing. But I also think the way we move and interact with our transportation networks is highly personal. 
you know, not everyone moves in the same way, in the same direction and with the same level of comfort. So I think we have to think about offering all these different choices as an extension of opportunity and flexibility. You know, people should be able to get where they want to go in a way that suits them the best. So by having transit, bike share, e-scooters, you know, all these different modes, I think that can really help people adapt to our changing transportation network in a way that is more meaningful and fair. That's a, a, a good uh, analogy about how important these different types of um, uh, connected networks are, are vitally important for cities. Jacob, I'm going to ask you, kind of building upon what Ann said, how does a connected bike network uh, improve mobility and the quality of life in cities? Yeah, um, thanks, Matt. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Jacob Vincic. I'm executive director at Bike Cleveland. and. Our work is really around advocacy and education around bicycling and pedestrian issues. Um, you know, for us, uh, in, especially in Cleveland neighborhoods, um, you know, 25 to 40 percent of people don't have access to a private automobile. Um, so for us, it's really about giving people a safe option and a safe choice to get around, um, whether that be, you know, accessing public transit, being a pedestrian on a, or on a bike. Um, improving the roadways uh, to ensure that, you know, people on bikes are considered when roadway projects are being redesigned and reconstructed. Um, but I often tell people, you know, if we if we built our interstate highway system the same way that we've built out our bike network, uh, nobody would drive. Uh, the car industry would collapse because um, people wouldn't be able to get from point A to point B. Uh, and really what we advocate for is building out connected bike networks so that somebody on a bike um, can get from home to work, from home to school um, in, in a safe, equitable manner. Um, in, in our work, uh, especially with Antilly and Councilman Zone on Vision Zero, um, you know, we've found, especially on the east side of Cleveland, um, uh, black and brown populations are overly represented in serious and fatal injury crashes. And if you look at the street network on the east side of Cleveland, it's very wide, very fast roadways. Um, so by, by reclaiming some of that right of way and, and building it out and calming the traffic and, and building it out for people biking and walking, um, we, can, we can impact that, that inequity, um, but we're also giving people an option and a choice on how they, want, how they can get around in our community. So um, let me set some context. That's a very powerful statement you made, Jacob, uh, in the city of, because we're gonna go to Lubanya Slovenia next, but in the city of Cleveland, we have roughly 10,000 uh, streets, roads, major roads, smaller roads uh, within our city. And of those 10,000, we did an analysis in the city of Cleveland where our crash is occurring and where our fatalities happening. And we were able to network those out and, and really identify that that roughly 10 percent, less than 10 percent of our, our city streets are where over 90 percent of these crashes are occurring and the fatalities are happening so if we can focus on those areas we can save people's lives the other uh, uh, comment that jacob made related to that is many of those came in some of our most impoverished communities and communities of color so this really gets down to becoming an equity issue and so how can we address this so we can pe keep people safe so let me go to my, my our good friend from lubanya uh matisse how did Lubanya turn so quickly to become one of the greenest cities in Europe and one of the cyclist friendly cities in the world? Hello from my side. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's uh, actually quite easy uh, to give you the answer because what we did, we changed the mentality of the people living in Ljubljana. And uh, it was quite hard at the beginning because our mentality is you must have as much cars as possible. You have to pay as much for the car as possible and you have to show that. You have to uh, park right side out of your living room and stuff like that, you know? And what we did, we closed the city center uh, for cars. And that's not just one road. That's uh, actually a huge area about 12 hectares wide, uh, all in one, in the whole city center. And we closed the main vein of the city. Before that, uh, there was around 60,000 cars driving through it every single day, and then we just closed it in 2013. And now only buses, cyclists, and pedestrians are allowed uh, to use this road. And what happened uh, after we implemented 
the bike sharing system, uh, which is right now the most efficient one in Europe, is that since 2007 till today, we have the decrease in car usage from over 60% to below 40%. And we are still aiming to reach the number 33% in five years. So uh, we're trying uh, really hard to improve even more cycling because that is the area where we have you know, growth every single year, five, 10% regarding the previous year. And that, especially then in 2016, when it became the European Green Capital, uh, and people starting to, started to uh, see what that means, not just to us, but uh, to Europe and to the world. Uh, they saw that uh, we are being recognized and then they started to think otherwise. They started to act otherwise in reality. So we're in a good process right now. Wow, that's quite impressive, the work you're doing in your beautiful city. Um, Justin, I'm going to ask you a question, but more from the lens of, for people who don't, aren't aware, Justin serves on our Regional Transit Authority uh, Board. Uh, and so, Justin, what's the future for public transportation? And given the recent changes that RTA is implementing, what do you view kind of the future of that system? Yeah, well, you know, Matt, I think we are at a critical crossroads right now at RTA, and we've been really excited about the work of India Birdsong, our new uh, chief executive officer. And, you know, before India joined the organization, uh, you know, we were really kind of a, a bus and train organization. And now we're trying to move to a transit as a service uh, enterprise to truly meet the needs of our city and our region as we try to, you know, address some of the concerns that Jacob and Ann talked about in their remarks. And, you know, I would say, you know, there are three things that that we're focused on from my advantage from my vantage point as a board member number one you know right before the pandemic we were really focused on our new route redesign uh, for our bus route across the region and through our work in the community we realized that we wanted to prioritize frequency of bus routes particularly in the urban core to really meet the needs of our residents uh, you know i started uh, uh earlier this year a technology and innovation committee to really understand how can we use data and analytics to improve the rider experience and also improve community engagement uh, with our riders as well across the region. And so, you know, we just uh, uh, executed Wi-Fi on all of our buses and trains across the entire network. Uh, we're also looking at how do we ensure uh, we uh, have more transparency and accountability as an agency. So we're launching a, a new uh, open data portal so that riders and residents can kind of get the latest information on our budgetary uh, issues, uh, bus routes, uh, data in terms of you know how you know civic technologies can access public data around transit to improve mobility technology solutions as well. And then thirdly, you know right before the pandemic, uh, we launched uh, a live streaming of our board meetings to ensure that we were able to really meet the needs of our riders so they can understand what was going on and get the latest information about what was going on with the agency. And so we're really trying to use data and analytics to improve the rider experience, but also ensure that we are adapting our business model to meet the needs of the region moving forward. Well, that's awesome. uh, Rick, you know, uh, so we've heard a lot about bikes. We've heard a lot about scooter, a little bit about uh, the network that our bus it's operating and you operate in rail and you're an advocate for high-speed rail uh, what works with rail and what's really next in high-speed rail in the future well so all around the world except in north america and south america on, on every other continent uh they are running trains that that would connect cleveland and chicago in roughly two hours and those trains run every hour. And uh, the typical train has more seats than a 737 has. So what that does is completely changes the way people choose to travel and it really shifts, um, it shifts market share from the auto to trains, which means people are coming into Cleveland without a car and you don't have to figure out where you're going to store their car for them. They're taking transit and, and other 
mobility services, and it supports a much more walkable, more financially stable city. And it's proven all around the world. The next step, uh, you know, Cleveland is working on a Hyperloop study for Chicago to, to Cleveland. Columbus is working on a separate study. We've worked with some folks who are working on a, a high-speed rail study from Detroit to Chicago. What really needs to happen is Indianapolis, Toledo, Detroit, Cleveland, Columbus need to band together because you will all share the same right of way through northern Indiana and into Chicago and figure out how to create a system that serves all of those places very well. Thank you for sharing that, uh, that perspective. Um, we've been joined by our uh, airport director, Robert Kennedy. And, and Director Kennedy, we've heard um, what, what's happening currently right now in our city and what's on the horizon dealing with uh, different types of uh, different uh, mobility uh, uh, opportunities. Bikes, scooters, e-bikes. We talked about bus. We talked a little bit about rail and then high-speed rail. Um, the airport is such an in integral component of the transportation network. So I'm gonna ask you to maybe stay, step back a little bit about um, the current operations. And I know you're all challenged right now in your industry because of this pandemic. But uh, my, my question to you would be, what, what's the future of air, what future air transportation changes will really reduce barriers for those who have sight, hearing, and different types of mobility challenges? What are you doing on that front? And then just give us some real time with what, what's happening with the air industry at this moment. Councilman, thank you. Sorry, I was having some technology difficulties. Difficulty and challenge. Um, our industry is in flux, but it seems over the decades I've been in the industry, we're always in flux. Uh, I said after 9/11, if I survive 9/11, that I could, I could meet, uh, overcome anything. Well, this is my new challenge. You know, the, I've worked. I've had the pleasure of working at airports around the planet. In uh, Asia, Africa, Middle East, uh, uh, Europe, and so forth. Airports, regardless, are intermodal interchanges. They are. Uh, flights uh, come, they go from an airport. Uh, it can be by train that the people come here or leave here. And Cleveland had the first uh, rail connection uh, between the airport and the city center, which, in my opinion, is the the hallmark of any great airport in the world that I've visited. You need that multimodal uh, uh, connection, both by rail, by car, uh, by scooter, by bicycle, all of those things to help people get to and from the airport. So what's next? In our industry, once we recover from this, and we will recover from this, um, the industry, I heard the, uh, the Hyperloop, uh, some discussion on that. How do we maximize that? Uh, every time there's been an innovation or technology, uh, some people decry uh, it will be a threat to aviation. Well, it's a threat and it's a blessing as well. Uh, and we look at the Hyperloop and other modes of transportation. The transportation network companies, drive autonomous vehicles, all of that will help us in our industry. More specifically, what we're doing here in Cleveland um, we have um, uh, underway a master plan uh, funded by our airlines here, $4.5 million to prepare for the next quarter century of aviation in Northeast Ohio. And part of that will be increased mobility. We have a pre 9 11 uh, design building, uh, and, I, uh, uh, and we're operating in a post 9 11 environment. Plus, Travelers now globally with visible or invisible challenges make up about 15% of our travelers. So here in Cleveland last year, that was 1.5 million travelers. And so we need to make sure that as we go through our design and all our concepts and our preferred alternative as we move forward, we accommodate that as a growing part of our, our customer and our guest uh, uh, segment. And that will definitely be incorporated. Uh, there, a number of years ago, I saw a, 
a uh, presentation of what's called intuitive architecture, where you have no signage, but the human body picks up light, pattern, uh, touch, feel uh, of uh, fabrics and wall coverings to help direct you to exits and to other things. So all of that we're going to look at, plus technology and how that helps us, particularly in the augmented reality. So those are some things that are going on in our industry, more specifically what's going on here in Cleveland and how we're preparing for that brighter future. Great. Hopefully that answered your, your question, Cal. Oh, no, that, that was a, a good intro into the complexity of, of particularly your industry. And we're gonna have more opportunity for interaction. I want to um, ask Matisse, I mean, You've heard my colleagues here in the school of Cleveland talk about different efforts that they're working on. Talk a little bit about, again, you come from one of the greenest cities on our planet. You're really working to um, uh, turn away from, uh, from uh, a fossil-based system within your city. Talk about some of the work you're doing and what we could learn um, of, of, of some of these other alternatives, transportation uh, modalities? Uh, yeah, um, you know, what we're trying to uh, do or send a message out, you know, it's important to realize that even if you go electric in cars, that is still a car, car is a car, it will take a place, it will still hit the environment when, when it's being parked there. So instead of that, we have to remove as many of that kind of vehicles from the streets and give the space back to the people because the space used to belong to us, you know. And what we're trying to do is to implement to put as many trees in our city, have as many parks out there, you know. And it's not just the way to change how people transport it's also the way how they think you know uh, because then it's much easier for them to organize uh, their day because if, it's too, if it takes I don't know 20 minutes by car and 30 minutes uh, by foot and 10 minutes by bike what are you going to choose you're going to choose a bike you know uh, so uh, there is a question also about airplanes I, I don't see in the near future what can change uh, come in, instead of the airplanes that probably mr kennedy can answer that question uh, better than i am but in, uh, regarding the cars of course uh, you know it's important to try to give people back the space they had you know and not just that you have to work with them when you plan in the city because uh, when you do some changes and they are not part of those changes, they're going to turn against you, you know? But if you involve them when you are planning something and listen to their ideas, to their needs, then they're going to be happy. And then they're going to realize that. Matisse, let me ask you a question. In those areas of your city that you're starting to close down and, and give those streets or those areas back to the people, um, for commerce, for retail activity, for businesses along those quarters, how are you delivering goods and services to those areas? Uh, we have a delivery time from 6 to 10 a.m. every morning, but you have to have the permission from the city. So you can't enter just uh, on your own. You must have the permission from the city, but only between 6 and 10 a.m. So let me throw out this broad comment, and um, we often hear in uh, transportation that last mile. <coughs> Trains, planes, uh, buses, they have distinct routes. Talk about the significance, and maybe I'll start with uh, Ann Tilly first. Give me your perspective, Ann, about the last mile. Yeah, thanks, Councilman Zone. I think um, the last mile is a particularly important aspect of what we think about our transportation connections. And I think it's particularly important in areas like Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, where we do have um, a lot, an immense amount of sprawl, you know, so being that last mile away is significant. It's not um, necessarily an easy connection, but um, when we think about if I could scoot, and I say scoot, that's the verb for it, that's what I'm calling it. Um, if I could scoot from 
my house to a train stop and be to work. You know, that that is much more appealing than if I say, well, I could walk almost 30 minutes if I'm able to walk to that train station and get to work. Um, it, it, it brings that into your realm of possibilities and it creates a very, very viable alternative than me getting in my car because, you know, thinking of me walking and connecting, it's long, it's hard, but, you know, adding this last mile connection through these light, um, light modes of transportation that are accessible, um, that they're also very flexible, that, that brings our network a lot closer than it used to be. Uh, Justin, same question to you. Talk about that that last mile. Yeah, I, I think Anne's spot on, and I think it speaks to the importance of integration uh, and strategic partnerships to ensure that uh, RTA uh, is working uh, more um, effectively with organizations like NOACA, the city, the county, and even our uh, develop developer partners in terms of looking at the importance of transit oriented and having that as an important lens of how we think about new projects coming online. Uh, and also, you know, when we think about the Uber, the Lyfts, the birds of the world, how are we building those partnerships uh, together as a, as a transit agency to get to that transit as a service model where first mile, last mile solutions can be a key part of how we work together with those other private sector partners to go a long way. So I think it's very critical and it's an important point to make sure that we're integrated when we think about the importance of uh, transit oriented development at, at large. So I would, uh, our panelists would welcome questions for those of you who are viewing this uh, session right now. Please type in a, a question in the chat box. I would uh, be happy to ask our, our group um, uh, the, any question that you may pose. Director Kennedy, talk about how important it is for somebody who runs a fairly large airport system to have the interconnection with rail, with bus, with um, creating options also for individuals, say if they wanted to ride a bike, do we have bike storage at the airport? Talk about those different components and how important they are for a successful airport system. Um, thank you, Councilman. Uh, it's, it's very important in, as we move forward, building more roads and having more cars, that's not the future. There are many successful uh, metropolitan areas around the world um, that integrate with the, with the airport that do it through several modes of transportation. Uh, whether it is bike, we do have bike racks. Uh, RTA that comes out here has a rack on the front of the bus uh, if, you, if they supplement the bus. I come from the world's busiest airport. And at the world's busiest airport, we had tens of thousands of people who used the rail every day. Uh, a, a large percentage of the population that worked at the airport every day used it. Um, we had a transportation management association at the airport that was uh, funding um, the employees and it was con uh, done by the uh, airlines concessionaire. Uh, and we need to do something here. So when we, we, we started down that path, we need somebody, when I was first joining in, was talking about the perception of how you don't have to take a car to the airport. You can take rail, you can take a shared use, uh, you can, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, autonomous vehicles. Those will really be a part of our future. And, and as I said earlier, we're making our master plan now. All of those figure into how do we expand uh, charging stations? How do we... How do we allow for this regional transportation here that is not 99% dependent upon um, a, a gas powered vehicle? How do we do that? And um, we have a special part of our master planning team that looks at regional connection, which is NOACA and a lot of the other um, organizations here. It must be holistic. And uh, um, that's what we're planning. That, that is exactly in the, and if you want to walk to the airport, we need to have that. If you want to ride a bike, we need to provide that. If you want to take a scooter, we need to provide that. And I can tell you, our planners are looking at that, um, that uh, carbon footprint. Um, and just as somebody mentioned earlier about what are airplanes doing or airplane manufacturing, 
They're experimenting with hydrogen fuel engines on aircraft. Biofuel is already uh, used uh, uh, in our industry. Uh, there are a couple of manufacturing uh, locations in this country. So I think the industry, aviation industry, headed up by ICAO in Montreal uh, and IATA headquartered in Montreal, are trying to address all of this as, so that we all have a better future. We have a responsibility and we need to make sure that we play an important part in that responsibility. Director Kennedy, I'm glad to have a question uh, about your master planning. Uh, that's correct, you are leading a, a large master planning effort looking at our airport system. I'm glad that you want to make sure that people can, um, because it can be daunting because of Homeland Security, to creating that safe network whether they're uh, gonna fly in a plane or maybe they're just employees because you employ a lot of people there have that option to have uh, that connection ledger for the floor that take a few speak from the perspective of cyclists. Um, we'll talk about the importance of, of equity when it comes to going to different facilities and being able to park the park the drive, the airport, or whatever. Talk about how um, Councilman Zone, you, you broke up a bit, but I think it was a talk about the importance as we go through the master plan on those uh, provisions for um, other modes of transportation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So, again, um, at this airport, along with a lot of other many uh, metropolitan area uh, airports, urban airports, we have a finite resource that's called land. And the best, highest use of airport land is not for parking, even though it's our largest revenue uh, generator on uh, uh, non-aeronautical revenue generator. Our highest, best use for the land is for taxiways, runways, ramps, and, and uh, gate areas. So we encourage, in a lot of airports, we encourage that we make those bike lanes. We uh, have charging stations. We have... Um, ways that we go, um, uh, in some ways, we, we discourage cars um, uh, in the fact that we have limited parking on the airport um, and uh, expansion of parking facility is not a way to encourage people to take alternate transportation. Uh, so if you, um, that's an economic way of uh, encouraging people to make other choices. And the highest, the highest group that we've seen uh, expand here is the transportation network companies, Uber, Lyft, and so forth. Uh, and uh, that gets high utilization of the finite land that we have here. But still, it's carbon-based fuel, most of those. And so for us, and as we go forward, uh, we're not going to make huge investments in parking. We're not. Uh, Economically, it makes sense. Social, uh, environmental, not so much sense. Plus, um, I think we'll see more and more autonomous vehicles, uh, and those will be electric or other, uh, as I said about the engines that are being experimented with, with aircraft, uh, hydrogen-based. I think there are a lot of technologies out there that are going to help us as we go forward, and our timing of our master plan is very good. Uh, and the fact that we can take advantage, advantage of that. Thank you, Director. Jacob, talk a little bit about the importance of uh, infrastructure, not only infrastructure on the road for cyclists, but when they get to their destination. Yeah, uh, and we work with a lot of uh, developers and businesses to uh, ensure they have adequate bike parking, both for uh, you know their employees and um, and their visitors. Um, I think one of the interesting things I've seen, especially over the past three or four years on a number of new developments, um, you know, that are mixed use, which include kind of work, work live scenarios is um, uh, the developers including in there things like bike rooms for their, uh, for their residents um, and including bike racks outside for the visitors. Um, I think that's something that, um, especially in Cleveland, I, I, it's been a while since uh, the city has implemented uh, a city rack city seats program where you know the city's providing bike racks 
um, out in public spaces for people to park their bikes. Um, since we've started, we, we've uh, we've helped install um, a little over 500 bike racks across the city. Um, but as we continue to see the bike network grow, uh, we're going to continue to see more people biking and we're going to continue to see more of a need um, for that. Um, I think and I also want to hit on one separate point. Um, I feel, especially in Cleveland, and, and don't get me wrong, I think we always have to be thinking about the future and Hyperloop and autonomous vehicles. Um, but at least from my perspective, we have immediate needs around mobility right now. Um, you know, we need local investment in RTA. We need local investment in improving the safety of our streets so people do have options on how they can get around. Um, and I, I think I'd really love to see that come more from um, city leaders, you know, just stop looking at all of the shiny, the shiny objects, but let's focus on our, our, our most current immediate needs now that, to be honest, um, can be done very quickly uh, and, and very cheap. Let me go to Matisse and Rich next. Uh, oh, Jay, Justin, I'll come to you in a minute, but Matisse, um, shiny objects, right? You know, the big sexy project people are wondering about. What, when did the, the culture shift in Lubanya that people started realizing they needed to turn away from uh, a carbon-based uh, mobility system? Talk about when did that shift occur in your city and, and really what's the future hold? Basically, we started to close the city center in 2007. Uh, that happened after the mayor was uh, elected in 2006 and he's still the mayor. So that's a good sign, you know, uh, because at first a lot of people were against it. We did the survey before we started closing the city center, over 50% of the population were, was against that measurement. Uh, three years ago, when we did the survey again, 97% of the people were against opening the city center again. So basically only 3% of the people were uh, for opening it again for the traffic. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing result, you know. And uh, it's our mayor always said, if you want to make as big uh, as, as big project as it was like this, you have to do it in the first year. Because after that, you will start preparing for your next, next elections. And people will forget in three years what you did and they will accept it. And they will see that it's better for them, you know. That's why you have to do it at the start of the mandate. And what we're doing now, we're just trying to expand that area. We have people uh, giving us ideas which streets we should close for the cars, which streets uh, where we should put uh, bike uh, racks, where we should put stations for bike sharing system, for car sharing system, and so on and so on. So they're really involved in uh, where they want something, uh, not just parking spaces for their cars. Well, I'm inspired by the work you're doing. I can't wait to come visit your beautiful city. Uh, as soon as possible. So, Richard, what, what would your response be? You know, Jacob said we should be investing in the basics. You know, Vince Lombardi, it's blocking and tackling. That's what he always used to say. Um, you know, we've thrown out the term hyperloop. You're talking about 200 mile an hour high speed rail. <laughs> is that something that's big and sexy or is that proven technology? Well, you know, high-speed rail has been around since 1964. Um, it's proven. Uh, China has, since 2009, they have connected basically Boston to Miami, to New Orleans, to Minneapolis, with a branch out to Denver. They've already built high-speed rail in that entire space. Um, and Europe has basically connected uh, the East Coast to Chicago. Um, so it's not a shiny new object, um, it's proven, and long distance travel, meaning anything outside a specific city area, is critical to every city. It's part of the blocking and tackling is making sure that it's easy for people to communicate with cities that are around them. And um, railroads are very flexible, you can do multiple things with one infrastructure. So for example, if you, I, I was, grew up in Cleveland. Um, unfortunately, I made the commitment as a child that I will get trains back into Cleveland Union Terminal, uh, which is now a mall. <laughs> and unfortunately, you guys put a federal courthouse in a really dumb place, but oh well. But imagine if you built a new railroad from, from Terminal Tower 
out by the airport um, to Toledo. Now you could have commuter trains going out someplace towards Toledo. At Toledo, it could branch and go to Detroit. So now you've got a solid connection with Detroit. Um, in that route, you've got both airports connected. So you've got a lot of flexibility. Um, and at Toledo, there's also a branch that goes out to Chicago. And you can do a lot of different things with that. Um, and the most exciting one, the shiniest object one, is making uh, Union Station in Chicago to Union Terminal in Cleveland in two hours, every hour on the hour. Thank you for sharing that. Justin, um, you know, Jacob talked a little bit about getting back to the basics. What's your thoughts of, as it relates to not only public transportation, just getting back to the basics? Look, I, I think Jacob's spot on. Um, you know, we're seeing it from our riders that housing costs and transit costs are two of the most expensive items for trying to make it in our city and you know we were just rated the biggest poor city in america and so you know i tend to think that i think it's good to have conversations about future technology like the hyperloop but we need to prioritize a back to the basic agenda especially as we think about a recovery strategy for our city and our region moving forward and so you know at rta we, we just executed a policy for two years of immediate bear relief for our riders moving forward i think secondly you're seeing cities like Kansas City and, and, and even LA starting to explore uh, free transit for riders. You know, it's something that should be on the table right now in our community because I look at it as an investment, not an expense. Mm -hmm. And so we can provide either free or highly subsidized transit for uh, the, the working poor in our city to make sure they can get to their jobs in an effective and efficient way that could go a long way to making us a more competitive region moving forward. And so I think we need to balance our priorities a bit more to ensure we're really meeting the needs of folks across our city that are struggling every day to make ends meet. No, you're absolutely right. I often say when you can create mobility for the, for the working class and the poorest in our community, you lift up the entire community. Uh, and, and so we need to do a better job of that. I remember when I was in Salt Lake City in 2002, um, I experienced what was called the free zone and mm. in a defined area in their central business district you could jump on any bus and it, it didn't cost you anything and it just moved you around throughout the city really lightened up congestion you saw less cars and vehicles in that free zone areas mainly service and delivery trucks but um, uh, it's a great concept I'm glad you're pushing that issue within our system I want to give um, the opportunity to uh, our panelists to maybe pitch a question or, or make a comment based on what you heard from one of the other speakers. And, and for those who are tuning in and listening, we would ask a question if you'd like to, to put it in the chat box. But anyone uh, want to ask one of the panelists a question? Councilman Zona, I'd like to uh, chime in on something that uh, Jacob said earlier, if you don't mind, and also a comment from uh, uh, Adam, um, leading to the airport on 237 is a bike lane. Uh, we have uh, a bicycle rack, but the most dangerous part of the trip is at 237 from Brook Park. It, it must be a holistic approach, not just bike racks at the airport or that we have a bike lane, but how do we modify the whole transportation? Uh, ecosystem, if you will, so that it's a good, safe journey, economical way to and from the airport, to and from Brown Stadium, to and from any location. Jacob was spot on about the basics and taking care of that. Um, and, and I'll go back to our master plan. We have a special regional group uh, that involves um, NOACA, the state, and a whole bunch as we're looking at how we improve that in the long term. Because I wouldn't have any of my family ride that bike lane from 237, um, just because we already have accidents just with cars out there. Uh, so it needs to be a holistic, simple approach. And uh, the uh, a bike rack doesn't cost a lot of money. Striping for a bike lane doesn't cost a lot of money. Those basics are essential to improving mobility in our city and in cities so just a comment that uh to speak to 
uh, Jacob's comment and then Adam. No, thank you, Director. No, it's a good point. Again, uh, it's been my experience. Uh, cyclists, they want a safe uh, mode to, to, to go places. Uh, it would be great to see a cycle track uh, be buffered and protected and create an opportunity that they can get right into your facility. I'm interested, Matisse, um, uh, I, I don't know how your airport system is in Lubanya, but can you talk a little bit about different uh, types of mobility systems and how they interact with your, your international airport? Basically, uh, our airport is about 30 kilometers outside from the city. Uh, so uh, right now there is no direct bike line, bike line because it's a little bit uh, too far and it's in the other region. Uh, but we have a shuttle line, we have car sharing system uh, that is operating in Ljubljana. It also has a station at the airplane. Uh, and we are really working hard and trying to convince the government because it's on the national level to have the direct uh, train line from this from the airport to the city so we don't at the moment we don't have the best connection because it's only by car or a shuttle uh, we have the bus but the bus doesn't go directly to the city it goes a little bit around uh, so it takes quite a lot of time so the best way is to rent a car sharing and come to the city or go to the shuttle that come directly oh, thank you matisse so i have a question in the chat box um and Tilly, uh, you have been uh, leading a lot of our policy and research around our Vision Zero uh, effort. Talk about the work of what the Education and Engagement Subcommittee is working on as it relates to bike and road safety. And, and what are we doing to help educate the Cleveland and greater Cleveland community around um, these topics? Thanks, Councilman. That, uh, and Rosarita, that is a great question. Um, because, you know, when I, I think when we think about, uh, and I'm sure Jacob can speak more to this too, but when we think about road safety and, you know, alternative modes of transportation, um, we can jump up and down screaming, everyone should ride their bike, everyone should take a scooter, everyone should take alternative modes. But um, if you don't feel safe doing that, that is not a very reasonable alternative. That is not something I would feel comfortable asking someone to do. You know, people get really mad um, when we see people biking or scooting on the sidewalks. But to me, I know that means they're not comfortable riding in the street. Um, so I think, you know, part of this is the education. You know, not everyone knows that bicyclists are legally allowed to be on the roads. Um, that, is in our, that is in our law. Um, but, you know, we also have to have the infrastructure um, that makes uh, all these riders feel safe. Um, when they use alternative modes, you shouldn't have to ride or I shouldn't have to drive a car to feel safe on our roads. Um, so we know, um, you know, some of this literature is emerging from city of Portland, uh, Charlotte, where they're, um, they're in their early stages of using e-scooters too. And, you know, um, in areas that had poor bike infrastructure, people rode on the sidewalks in places where there was protected bike lanes, um, you know, uh, slower speed. We, we knew that people weren't riding on the sidewalks. Um, so it, it is this delicate balance. We have to educate people of, you know, how do these new uh, mobility options operate on our roads? What are their rights? Um, you know, and how do we manage that interaction? But we also have to do the other half of that, which is making sure they feel safe uh, and protected. No, very good point. Um, that's the biggest scare out there for, for not only young people, but the mom who's maybe has, uh, uh, you know, is pulling along their, their small child on the bike. We need to create safer options for them. I want to give, um, we're nearing the end of this session. I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity, just a couple minutes to share some closing remarks. And then maybe we might do one, one, one question towards the end. Um, so I'm going to start with Matisse, but there's a question in the chat box. If you could answer the question first uh, about riding and, 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 and cycling in Lubanya, talk about the infrastructure, how it's built out. Are you on streets? Are you in separated cycle tracks? How, how is this happening in your city? 
Uh, yeah, what just Anne actually was saying is the most important thing uh, is safety. And then after that, it's uh, co uh, how comfort you are as a cyclist, because it, the worst thing you can have is bicycles jumping up and down, you know, on the sidewalks and so on. So you won't you, you won't be using a road and it's built like that. So it's really important to build uh, cycle lanes away from the cars, away from the streets, so on, either on the sidewalks or even have it uh, physically located after, I don't know, a green lane of grass or something like that. But uh, Ljubljana is a little bit older city, that's why we have re really narrow streets. Uh, so we're trying, what we're doing at the moment is narrowing uh, car lanes to the minimum possible uh, by the law and expanding sidewalks and bike lanes that are physically uh, away from the street, from the road. And uh, what we're doing right now, we have over uh, 300 uh, kilometers of cycle lanes that are connected in the city and we're expanding this uh, map uh, every year. Thank you, Matisse. Um, Justin, any closing comments or thoughts? I would, I would just say, you know, after uh, watching last night's debate, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, two thoughts came to mind. Number one, uh, all politics is local and now more than ever, all solutions are gonna be local. And we all need to roll up our sleeves in the private, public, nonprofit sector and really think differently about how we're gonna really meet the moment we're in right now to ensure that our city and our region can truly live up to its true potential. And it's gonna take new ideas and a new boldness and leadership to get that done. And I'm uh, confident that the folks on this call uh, here in Cleveland and abroad will uh, help lead the way. So happy to be on the discussion today. Thank you so much, Justin. Richard, um, some final thoughts? Um, you know, I just wanna clarify, I brought up Hyperloop, but we're talking about high-speed trains, which are proven technology. Hyperloop has been studied since 1971 and there isn't a prototype yet. Um, but I see that as, as a, the Hyperloop study is a clear recognition of the business community that some other form of link to Chicago is desperately needed. Um, and you really should pursue that. I also wanna add in um, uh, my own personal interest I would like to see the RTA come up with a unified vehicle that serves all of the uh, rail lines um, with a modern light rail vehicle. It's, it's doable, it's not super easy, but it's doable and boy, wouldn't it be exciting to have one modern type of vehicle that serves all those rail lines. Um, and then connecting with high-speed trains at Cleveland Union Station and at the airport. Yeah, no, good, good point. And I know Justin's working towards that with his colleagues. Director Kennedy, final thoughts? Just to chime in with what Ann said, safety, health uh, is the key components. We are seeing it in the aviation industry. Uh, people are shying away. Uh, they're not feeling uh, uh, healthy or safe. Um, and so in our industry, we've got to do it. But we've got to do it in all modes of transportation um, so that people will take it. Uh, we reduce um, our, uh, our reliance upon um, fossil fuels and that, you know, the, the whole attitude about how we have shared mobility. Um, it, is, uh, it is, for my family, uh, uh, we personally don't want to buy another vehicle. We want to use autonomous vehicles or Uber or Lyft or whoever those guys are as we go forward. And I think as it plays into the airport, uh, we've got to use some of that uh, approach, uh, fractional ownership and so forth of aircraft uh, to reduce uh, uh, the carbon footprint in the atmosphere. So, uh, and thank you because safety, health, security, all of those things play into all our forms of transportation. But most notably, the airport gets the highest visibility these days. So uh, thank you for that. That's all I've got to say, Council. Thank you, Director. Jacob, uh, any closing comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with everything Justin said. You know, all politics are local, hyper local. Um, you know, I would just add, 
you know, safe, connected mobility options are really a civil right. Um, I, I really think um, I know that if we focus on how we are allowing our residents to get around in, in, a, in a safe fashion, um, people will be able to access jobs. People will be able to get to school safely. Um, it'll improve our environment. Um, and I really think that's where the focus of, you know, the folks on this call, but also our, our civic leaders really needs to be is around um, kind of the needs of our residents and how they're able to get around. And, and if we really want to see Cleveland grow, um, we need to invest in, in better bike, pedestrian, transit infrastructure, because um, that's, what, that's what people want in the city. Um, and that really needs to become a priority. Thank you, Jacob. And we have about less than a minute um final final thoughts you might have yeah you know i want to echo that statement jacob said um because i believe it's that important um safe mobility and being able to travel is a it's a civil right um so i think as as we move forward we really need to be having equity as our cornerstone in everything we do in terms of mobility and transportation Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists. I do want to give a shout out once again to our sponsors, Platform Brewery, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Supply Side Group, Almore Burn, Rotary Club of Cleveland, Eaton, Taiwan Sister Cities, CIP USA, Margaret Wong and Associates, Team Neo, the Peace Corps, 12 Literary Arts. Um, I love all the work that Global Cleveland is doing to connect us with our cities. Um, having Lubanya in the house, solid way to go, Lubanya, um, is great. Uh, and it's great to uh, work with such competent people over at uh, Global Cleveland. Thank you to Cleveland Public Library for hosting this event. Uh, we appreciate you. This video will be archived and uh, you can view this later. And I thank you all for participating in this session. Have a wonderful day.